Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday q and I'm Eric Griffin, president of ITM Trading. With me, I have Lynette Zhang, our chief market analyst. For those of you who don't know or are tuning in for the first time, we take your questions submitted to us via email to questions at itmtrading.com. We take them, we put them on the screen here in front of us. We ask them live so you get a real, true, spontaneous, organic response. A lot of stuff going on in the markets these days, huh? <laughs> yes. I love that, that absolute safe trade, the treasuries. Yeah, not so safe, is it? Oh, what, what's this? What's this news? Well, it, it's, not, it's not new news, but we've seen basically the two years trading like a penny stock, the level of volatility and what's bringing down the banks. It's the loss of value in all the treasuries that they're holding on their, on their balance sheet. Right, because they and all locked them in at lower interest rates, right? And now it, the interest rates have spiked. Exactly. Well, yeah, the interest rates have, you know, and somehow the Fed just didn't even know that. I mean, even though they're doing it, right. but uh, yeah, let's not test for that. We're, that could never happen. We just drop in an, in a crisis. So yeah, so it's a, yeah, lots of interesting things going on. All right, so I'm sure we'll okay. get some questions in relationship to this. So let's see what Manuel C asks. We are hearing all the problems with the FDIC concerning mm -hmm. not enough in reserves to cover all the eligible covered accounts, mm -hmm. but have not heard anything regarding SIPIC on the brokerage side. Is there a parallel environment brewing <clears throat> that, that could potentially take down the market? Well, there is a parallel. And you know what? I haven't looked at SIPIC. Edgar, would you send me a note and I'll, I'll take a look at that. But there is a parallel environment brewing in SIPIC because you've got a lot of these banks. I mean, this is the problem that a lot of them are having that locked in those interest rates when they were near zero. And now the Fed's been raising the rates and they haven't, don't seem to really have accounted for it, but it's all of those derivatives. That's the real problem that could easily and will overwhelm the central bank's ability to bail this out and keep this going. I mean, we are, we are, there's not one little doubt in my mind that we are at the end of this can kicking road. So yes, there is a parallel environment and we aren't going to see it until it's too late to do anything about it. It's that, it's that tip of the iceberg. That's all we're seeing. We're not seeing the rest of the cracks in the iceberg underneath, but that's, what's going to kill us. Okay. So Terry K asks, should we go to a digital system? Does the money we already have, oh, should we go to a digital system? Does mm -hmm. the money we already have in the bank get automatically converted or will we lose it entirely? <coughs> oh, it'll, it'll get converted because they want you to use it. But just remember, we vote with our purses. So if you leave that money inside of the system, then uh, they'll convert it. But what its value, what its purchasing power value is going to be, remember, once they go to negative rates or once they go digital, these are their words, not mine. There are no limitations to how low they can push interest rates. And they intend to have their finger on that button, of their policy button, constantly, 24-7. This is what they're telling us. So will you lose it? Terry, I'm afraid that you're blinded by numbers and numbers don't mean anything. You look at Zimbabwe, they've got billionaires that can barely buy three eggs with their billions of Zimbabwe dollars. That's why you got to have this and you got to have this physical in your possession. You hold it, you own it. So yeah. yeah and, I, and just remember, we vote with our purses so or wallets. So if you stay inside of the fiat money system, whether that's stocks or bonds or ETFs or mutual funds or annuities <coughs> or savings accounts or any of that, you got to have a certain level. But if you leave more in there, that's your vote. And you're really basically voting to go on a digital system. They find more people buying gold. Mm, that tells them. Now we've got a community that's saying no. This, this is all you have to do to revolt. You just have to make different choices, real money. All right, so Jacqueline D says, let's say I'm a homeowner. <clears throat> let's say I'm a homeowner that has a, a mortgage to a bank that collapsed. What happens to that mortgage? Well, what the bank, the next bank that comes in, will 
most likely buy that mortgage, right? So they buy the good stuff and then they leave the garbage with the FDIC and the FDIC creates a, a bad bank. So that your mortgage will be sold to whatever entity is taking over the assets of that bank. Yeah, they're not going to just get rid of that. Oh, no, it doesn't just go away. It's an asset to them. Correct. All right, so Kyle asks, with the race, recent bailouts of SBB and possible other banks, are we safe to assume that bail-ins will not happen and that our funds in banks will be safe? I would not be assuming that at all because they are still picking winners and losers. And right. if you listen to Janet Yellen, what did she say? Well, we all agreed that this was systemically important. Well, who was that? I mean, in 2008, they bailed out the banks. And in 2023, so far, they bailed out the venture capitalists and the tech giants, right? If you're, and, and they're saying, well, they're not, they, they don't support people leaving community banks. But if you're just, look at what happened in, again, 2008 through 2011 with all those bank failures. Those were small community banks. So I'm sorry, but you're most likely going to get bailed in. They're just not ready to show that hand yet. And they definitely selectively bailed out venture capitalists. Yeah. Well, and they even said in the meeting that Yellen had, she was saying that, well, when, when people are asking very direct questions, can we ma basically make the same assumption? And she was like, well, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, right? Garbage, are they systemically garbage. You're right. Mm -hmm. Are they systemically important? We have to decide. So, yeah, I, I would say that there's no way to know the answer to that question for sure, but yeah. better to be safe than sorry. I mean, if you have gold and silver, if you don't keep anything more than 250 in there, number one, that should be your number one thing. Don't keep more than 250 in there because that's where the FDIC limit is. So at least the promise that they made is 250, right? But then on top of that, have gold and silver, which it will protect you from any of the stuff that's about to come. Exactly. <clears throat> and, and, you know, and not only that, even with the 250, because, and I've been saying this for a long time, now it's really obvious that the central banks are between a rock and a hard place. So they have to keep raising rates if they are even going to really kind of remotely show that they're trying to fight inflation. But we are now seeing the result because remember, right. policy and then there's a lag time, right? We go digital, there's no lag time then they get to see it in real time and respond to, to how it's impacting. So just keep in mind, no, your, any, any wealth that you hold in the fiat money system is not safe, period. They are intentionally attacking it, period. It's just that simple. So this is a true diversifier. And if, if whatever you hold in the system, because we have, it's still our tool of barter. So we still have to hold a certain level in there. And the strategy addresses that based upon your particular needs and goals and, and all of that. But this is a true diversifier because it's tangible. It's outside of the system. So whatever you're going to hold there, you can balance it with this. So if this all goes to zero, you're still fine. Okay, what else do we have? Let's see. <clears throat> Linda M. asks, I am wondering if the investment banks, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, etc., are in as much trouble as the regular banks, though there are those encouraging people to put their money in these banks because they are safer due to different rules and laws governing them. How true is this? It's, <coughs> it's not true at all. You know, the investment banks like Fidelity, Charles Schwab, I mean, they have a tremendous amount of derivatives. And I mean, how much are you really hearing anybody talk about the derivative problem? None. Correct. And yet I saw, according to the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, I mean, what does it say to you that, that FDIC insured banks and, you know, and, and actually some of these have gotten their banking licenses you know, what does that say when they're willing to pay $180 trillion to make the derivative population look like $185 trillion? 
Do you imagine the level of fees that they are saving that they're not really balancing out that portfolio? It's got to be. And since a lot of the derivatives, their leverage is a thousand to one. What are we looking at? A hundred quadrillion? 180 quadrillion? No, they're not safe. There is nothing that is safe inside of this fiat money system. Nothing. This is the end. It's the end. Make no mistake about it. Yeah, it's not safe. It, it's not true that they're safer. All right, so Marcus A. asks those live questions here. What happens to secured credit cards backed with the CD account during hyperinflation? <clears throat> hmm, that's a good question. Probably. Probably. Basically be cheerleaders. Well, I try to... The ones that I read, though, are non... They're not... Oh, they're not the mainstream. Right, it's, well, you, you pay them for their their for forecasting, right? And not, they're not necessarily tied in. So they, they'll they make recommendations based on what they see. And, yeah. and I haven't seen any of them saying, now's the time to be in stocks. It's more of a, a risk off mentality when it comes to stocks at this point. Right. And these days you've got risk on one day, you've got risk off the next day. And of course, you know, if you've got a long time horizon, none of this should bother you. Hey, if you've got bonds, just hold them to maturity. Nothing's going to bother you. That is such garbage because all the while, you're losing purchasing power. The currency is going to zero. So that's the only thing that you can convert the stocks back into is that fiat money. So what does that mean? Trillion times zero is still zero last time I checked. All right, so... Let's see, the Mad G asks, not giving financial advice, but in 2004, a friend owed me money and paid with gold at 320 an ounce. That's six times my money I've been collecting since. Yep. And it'll yeah, get I mean, a if lot you held more. It, if you held it, all that gold at 320 an ounce all the way to now, that's great. Yeah. And so, don't sell it. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is not the time to be liquidating it. Um, but yeah, yeah that's great. We have people liquidating right now, and I'm like, Why? I can't believe. I can't believe anyone would be selling right now into this market. Right. It's That's crazy with, because the market is obviously the, falling apart. Right. Like now's the time to be getting it, not getting rid of it. Exactly. Especially uh, there's been the thing that scares me right now is there's a lot of talk and it's mainstream media. It's not conspiracy theory. It's not just YouTube channels, but like I saw it on CNBC. Somebody told me they saw it on CNN. I saw a report on Fox News, uh, little snippets that I watched of it that was talking about um, that all these countries are trying to circumvent the dollar as a world's reserve currency, get Saudi Arabia to, like China just negotiated a deal with Iran and Saudi Arabia to come back to terms with each other. And then they're trying to get the, the U.S. dollar out of the petrodollar out of there right. and trade it in yuan. And uh, man, if that happens, we're well, in big trouble. You know, what is the plus, or rather I should say, who is the plus in OPEC plus? It's Russia. Oh, yeah. Right? And so that's a pretty close relationship with Saudi Arabia. And I don't know, do you think it's a coincidence that they were backing Swiss, uh, Credit Suisse and then all of a sudden, you know, they Credit Suisse put some sanctions on Russia and all of a sudden they kind of said, nope, we're not doing any more. And Credit Suisse is owned by UBS now. Do you think that's a coincidence? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe that's part of the de-dollarization. Hmm. Well, that's what's got me worried right now. We've been talking about it for years, but it seems like well, it seems it's, like it's, it's starting to come to a head. Exactly, it's inevitable. You know, no country's currency retains that world reserve status forever. Not one. We've had it a lot longer thanks to the petrodollar. But that whole system is breaking down. This is not something that just happened. This is something that's been evolving, and it's actually been growing and growing since when did the Fed first have to buy back Treasury debt? That was the end of 2002. So, you know, wasn't it Ernest Hemingway when, he, when somebody asked him how he went bankrupt? And he said, slowly at first and then quickly. Then all at once. Then all at once. Thank you. 
So that's what's happening. And I'm seeing an awful lot of parallels right now to 2008, a lot of parallels to 2008. So time is running really short. What are you going to do? If you are not prepared, you better get your butt in gear. All right. Well, that's it for today as far as questions are concerned. Any cool content that you've put out in last week? Uh, well, make sure you watch yesterday's video on the Fed's role in supporting foreign central banks because this is global and what it means for the U.S. dollar. And, you know, again, we launched a new Spanish channel and it's, it's, we, it's just short. It's like very short. So I think it's a good, it's in both English and Spanish, but it's a great tool to get other people that would not sit down and watch a half an hour video. These are like 10 minutes ish somewhere in there. So you might get somebody to watch that and then open the discussion. I think it's important. I also think it's important to subscribe and start taking advantage of our beyond gold and silver channel because you've got to execute the whole mantra. It is critically important to be as self-sufficient and independent as possible and community could arguably be one of the most important elements because one person can't. It's impossible for one person to do everything. So go to Beyond Gold and Silver, check that out. And wherever you come in, just please get started. Food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. Get it done. Wealth preservation, barterability, get it done. And make sure if you haven't done this yet, 100% click that Calendly link below. Set up your own gold and silver strategy so that you have a plan and then get it executed as quickly as you possibly can. This is totally not the time to be dilly-dallying. So if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe, especially these days with everything that's unfolding. Leave us a comment, give us a thumbs up, and share, 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 and remember, Financial shields are made of physical gold and silver. Definitely not paper promises. And until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.